How's everybody today? We're good? You good? Jacob, you good? Everybody? I'm good too. Man, it's uh feels good in here. Yeah. I feel it like my hands are like vibrating and my chest is like on fire. Who's running the camera today? I'm just gonna <laughs> Oh Jesus, we worship you. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you for who you are. Jesus. There's no one like you, Jesus. The way you speak to us, the way you love us, the way you care about us. How gentle you are, Jesus. Jesus, I thank you for your correction. I thank you for your mercy. God, you're so beautiful, Jesus. Everything you do just leaves us in awe. God, I ask you to breathe on this message today. Lord, that we wouldn't just be wowed by you, but we would be wooed into a relationship with you. Jesus, come speak to our hearts. We just take authority over this ground and we just, we just command every distraction to leave right now in Jesus' name. Jesus. Man, it's hard to get out of that place once you're in it. You just want to stay there. You're just so beautiful. It's all about you. You're so holy. You're so worthy. Man, it's so he's so good. Oh. Do I have a title? Yes. Saying yes to Jesus is my title. Uh, this week I changed my message about a half a dozen times, like always. And then last night when I was trying to go to bed, I I preached my sermon probably five times. And woke up in a sweat. And it's like uh, you, you get so worked up and you get so nervous to, to come up here and to, and to stand in front of people and the people I love, my church family. It's so funny that I get so nervous. It just like eats my lunch. But then once you get up here, it's, it's so easy because who am I here to talk about? It's him. And I, and I love him. And if you love him, you'll talk about him. And you'll tell people about him. So I just want to share my heart and what God uh, speaks to me, like when I read scripture. And Brittany uh, pretty much did my whole sermon, so I think I can, I can skip a couple. I mean, even to a vision that I've had of, like, spitting on Jesus. I mean, it's just the vein that we're in in this church right now is together, and it's of unity, and it, it really, really makes me excited that I can go do what I do and we're all doing the same thing. Like we're, we're separate for some parts of it, but we're all do, God's all pointing us to the same thing. And that's what he's saying. And then we're all saying the same thing too. It's just look at him, find him, keep him, hold him, never let him go. So I was going to honor my uh, beautiful wife who's got up with the baby. <laughs> oh, um, so I'll just honor her anyways. Uh, Cindy, I love you. There's no one like you. You're so beautiful, and you lead this family well, and I really appreciate that and honor you. My uh, my friends are here, Jason and Tiffany. If you guys uh, if you guys don't see me, that's that's where I'm at. They have a, a ministry in Holden called the Lyric House, um, and they're starting a community, a church. Um, and it starts at like two o'clock, um, and I, I really love their passion for what they're setting up, uh, for what's going on there, because they are in Holden, Missouri, of all places, and it's a it's a really small place. Um, but they don't see it as a small place; they see big opportunities uh, to tell people about Jesus, not only tell them about Jesus, but to plug them in and and be a witness. That's their town. That's where they're at all day. 
Um, and it's really cool because it starts after church. They don't want to take away from any, any other church and what any other church is going and what they're doing. And I find that very honorable that they want a place where ministers can go get ministered without having to set up the chairs or uh, worry about announcements or when's, who's coming on and what's coming on. You can just come and just sit at the feet of Jesus and look at them. So they're harboring a, an atmosphere, creating an atmosphere where you can do that. And I, I think the Lord is going to kiss it so many times and bless it. So if you guys are ever in Holden, um, I'm not sure when it starts, but it's, it's in the works now. And I just love you guys. And this church, I have to honor this church. You guys, your servant leadership model is just, I love it. Every single time, from the communications, from me having to speak, and, you know, the songs and all that kind of stuff, everything it takes to do church, you guys just function so well together. And if you have problems, you, you love each other, and you work them out, and, and you go through these problems together, and you don't give up on each other. And I admire that, and I love it, I honor it. So my goal in this message today um, is to do one thing, and that's to point at Jesus. And if anything I ever say seems like it's coming back to me, it's not. And I, that's not my intention. It's always him. Every healing, every word, everything, it comes from him because I'm just flesh. I can't do anything if he's not working and speaking with me. So... As Brittany was saying, um, I think she said, run to me, is what you were saying. When, um, when we get in trouble and we do something bad, man, God sure is mad at us, right? No, he's sure not. He's, he's still sitting there and he's saying three simple words, come to me. And when we do something bad, that's our, that's our thing. We get out of here. We run. We try to separate ourselves from God, which is really super funny that we choose to go that avenue. Like, we can't be separate from him. So why do we choose to turn our backs and act like, oh, I did something bad, so I'm just not going to talk to the Lord for a while, and then when he's done being mad at me, I'll come to him. And this that's not, just not true at all. I mean, the moment that you feel it, it is so important, and it'll save you so much turmoil. It'll save you so much guilt and so much shame if you just position your heart and say, Jesus, I know I did wrong. I know I didn't listen to you. Forgive me. You know, you don't have to sit there. You don't have to sit there on your knees and, and waller and beg and beg and beg and beg. You just ask him, and he says, I've already done it. I've already forgiven you for every past, present, and future sin that you will ever create. Does that mean that we don't come to him and say sorry? Absolutely not. But what forgiveness and repentance looks like is just a readjustment, a realignment, a, a refocus here because we're too focused here. And then if we start to get weighed down with guilt and shame, then that intimacy is just not there. And if I don't have that intimacy, I don't have the Lord. I just have a figure of what I think he is. I need a close, personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. I need to hear his voice. I need to hear what he thinks about me. I need to feel what he thinks about me. Because Jesus can do some crazy things if you'll just let him. If you'll just go into that door and you'll shut it. And then you'll, you'll block out your kids. You'll block out your husband. You'll block out your wife. You'll block out your job. And you say, it's just me and you, and I'm just here for that. And what I'm here for is you. And I don't want anything else. I just, I just throw everything away and I ask you, Lord, to speak with me and to be with me. I'm here to meet with you. And I can tell you that he will, he will bless it 100% of the time because he sees your heart and he knows that you're willing and, and you're coming to him and you're saying, it's just you. So I implore you guys to try that tonight. Try that when you have your time with the Lord. You know, if you have your, your strategy and your setup and your, your, your things that you do in your motion, try to just put everything away and say, it's just you. I'm here for just you. And the Lord has spoken so much on my life through just coming to him for him. And I feel like I was like, oh man, God, once I figured this out, I was like, man, I've wasted so much time, Lord. Because um, as I said before, we went through on my last message, um, when I meet with somebody, we set up a Bible reading plan and we set up a prayer plan. 
And, you know, when are you going to meet with God? Because God really, really loves it when you're intentional with him and you say, I'm meeting you every day at six o'clock. And like I said last time, he's sitting there wringing his hands and he can't wait. It's like 5.55 and he's like five more minutes and I get to spend some time with Jesse, just me and him. And we get to go through this word together and I get to breathe on it. And I, need, I get to make it brand new to him because he's read this book before. Uh, but it's funny that video we were watching too where you can read something about David and Goliath and it doesn't mean anything about David and Goliath because the Lord has breathed in it in that season and spoken to you about it. So even though I've read this book many times, I can open it up and still be wooed by Jesus because he says, come to me. And when I come to him, he, he doesn't disappoint ever because Jesus does not disappoint. He doesn't. If you are coming to see him, he's already been waiting for you. So it's funny when I say I love you, Jesus, but it really should be I love you too because he's already said it first. He's already shown me it first. So it's really funny every time somebody says I love you, and it's just like, oh, Jesus, I love you too. Every time I feel that feeling of love for him, I know that he's pulling at me saying, remember when? Remember when? Remember when you stood up in the airport and preached the gospel? Remember when you, you stopped and you paid for that person's lunch? But with a daily habit of coming to the Lord, you can get complacent. Reading your Bible, daily, you can get complacent with the Lord. Praying, Sometimes it just feels dry, you know what I mean? When, you're, when you've had a long week and you can't shut out the world, and that's why I said you just need to come in and it's just you, and that's what I learned, it's just you. But there's been times where I'm like, Lord, I'm here. You said come to me and I'm here, and I have my Bible out and I'm just not feeling it. And I get frustrated. But praise God, he has all the answers. Let me get into my Bible here. I got a Bible so you know that I, it's, we're going to read out of it today, and it's going to be great. I just need to find which one. So I was reading in John 5, 39 through 40, and it's the red letters. So Jesus said that, and it's really important to listen to that. He said it. It says, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the, but the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. And he was talking to people that were already there. You know, and he even said to people, you know, come to me, all you who are uh, weary, and I will give you rest. And he was saying that to people that are no further away than you guys are to me. And that got me really thinking that when he says, come to me, it is not just a physical thing that we need to do. Because the, the, the Pharisees came to him, and they were all about the Bible, and they knew the Bible, and they knew, they knew it really well. So if, if I just come to him, and I think when he says, come to me, I think it's to read my Bible, we can still miss it, guys. We can because come to me is not a physical location. It's not a tucking yourself away in your room and shutting the door and blocking off the kids and the wife and the work. The come to me is, it's just you. So remember that if you're feeling dry, but you're, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? You're supposed to be reading the Bible every day. You're supposed to be praying every day. Um, but Jesus doesn't want you to do it because you're supposed to, you know? When he says come to me, it's an option, you know? To him, he's like, come to me. And you get to make that choice. And then you get to display it out for him. What are you bringing to him? I bring you everything. And then tomorrow I bring you everything again until there's nothing left but just me and you. And once you reach that state, it's, it's where God can really start to do the real work. The, the deep work that is like sanctification. Like, man, maybe I, maybe... Maybe I shouldn't swear so much, you know? Maybe that's something God wants me to do. Or uh, maybe I shouldn't gossip, you know? And that, that's where he can, he can really speak to you and get down, um, get down to business. It 
And during that time when he's saying, um, and he's, he's saying, come to me, and he's calling you um, to draw near, it's so that he can, he can hold you, he can love you, he can, he can whisper sweet promises to you, um, he, can, he can be intimate with you, he can tell you things that nobody in this whole world would ever tell you. And what I find um, super duper amazing um, is when, when you are coming to him and he tells you um, his thoughts about you. Um, I was reading in Psalms 139, 17 through 18. It says, how precious are your thoughts about me, O God? They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. And that got me to think, like, what? Have you guys ever held sand before? Have you guys ever seen sand in a microscope? I mean, there is so many little particles and pieces to sand. And his thoughts for us outnumber all of the sand in the world. I'm just like, uh, on my face, like, you got to be kidding me. I can go pick up some sand, and I can have, I have a wife, six kids, and I can, I can start taking these little granules of sand, and I can say every single thought I have for my wife, every single thought I have for all of my kids, and I guarantee it's not even a handful. So when he says, come to me, you have no idea what he wants to say to you. And if we're not open to hear it and we harden our hearts because we think we know it all, we just won't receive it. I just think it's so crazy. His thoughts outnumber the, and I just think about that daily when I ask God, what do you think about me? And you can ask him that every single day and he will tell you something new. Thank you, Jesus. Man. I'm just so excited. I don't know what, like where to start, what to do. So I'm going to transition now, um, saying yes to Jesus. Uh, when I was putting together this message, um, all of this was really, really heavy on my heart. And I'm saying, you know, I'm saying a bunch of stuff like, come to me, and it's only him, and, and stuff like that. But like, where, how do you get to that point is basically um, what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get at. So let's go to uh, the main topic will be Hebrews 12, 1. And uh, I was meeting with uh, Jacob. I meet with him every Saturday. I love this man's heart for the Lord. He is making me so proud, so proud of him. I meet up with a lot of people, um, or used to meet up with a lot of people, and I've been meeting up with Jacob, and just the revelations that you have from God blow my mind. And your willingness to obey, too, is so important. And you're so humble and teachable. Uh, I just love it, man. You're doing awesome. So it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race, has, the race God has set before us. And I just want to uh, break that down a little bit and how I understand it. So it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. And that makes me think, um, what is he talking about? Because when I, when I read the Bible, I say, okay, God, you said, therefore, since we are surrounded. So since I am surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. So that would be, um, it reminds me of when Scott was talking to uh, this gentleman. Um, I don't remember your name. Um, when he was talking to you and he said that you will show people. That's what it's talking about. Because you have a lot of people around you and they're all watching, you know. And like Jacob and Brittany, everybody, 
We all have people that are watching us. And I know in my life, uh, when I said yes to Jesus, I was a, a booze hound and a, a, one of the biggest drug dealers in South Dakota. Um, and when I said yes to Jesus and I stopped doing all that stuff, who was I surrounded by? These people that said, oh, Jesse thinks he's better than us now. He's let it all go. He went to go be with the Lord. God bless. He's out. See you later. We'll see you when you come back and you want to you wanna start doing those things again. But we get a chance to show them. You know? We get to show them what this life of faith is all about. Because they see now. You know? They know now. And um, I was just talking to Cindy about this, and it, it was blowing my mind that, um, you know, it's really fun to take stock, you know? What's happened in my life, and who's, like, who's watching? Who can, who can I be a good example to? Who can I spur on? Who can I say, hey, man, I see you. Let, let's talk about Jesus. You know, let's do it. Or if somebody, uh, me and Jacob were talking about it, if somebody's gossiping, um, how hard is it to be like, hey, I don't want to talk about that guy like that. Let's, uh, uh, he's not very nice to his woman. Let's pray for him. Let's pray for him. God, I thank you. I thank you that he's not that way. I thank you that you didn't make him that way. And God shows up in your conversation instead of feeling all filthy when you're done. And that's just one of the opportunities when you're surrounded by, because there's always people watching, you know? There's always people. The devil's an accuser, and he will, he's doing that day and night. Right now, as we speak, he's up there accusing you. How can he, how can he do this? How can she do that? Are you serious? And Jesus is saying, no, it's okay. I've paid that. I've paid that. That's, that's my son I'm, in whom I am well pleased. He's defending you. How blessed are we that we get defended by the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the lover of my soul. There is no one like you, Jesus. I magnify your name above all else. And as we, as we read on, it says, um, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up. So when I read this, I'm going to take God at his word, and I feel like he's given me a tip here. He has separated weight from sin. So that must mean that there's things in my life that's not sin, but they're just weighing me down, you know? They're just, they're taking precedence in my life and they're holding me back from a deeper, more meaningful, true relationship with Jesus. And I think if we all think right now, there was that thing in your head that said, yep, that's that for me. Um, whether it's your cell phone, whether it's your job, whether if it's gossip, whether it's friends, whether it's the bar, like you tell me what that, what that weight is in your life. And he's telling you, Let us strip it off. So let's strip it off. Where is that weight that God is God is telling you that's just keeping you back from just running with Jesus? You know, He likes to walk with you, but He also likes to run and dance with you as well. (laughs) It's got a good vision of everybody just dancing in this church. I love I love that kind of that kind of worship and that kind of atmosphere. And then it says, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. So what is that in your life, you know? What is that, that sin that's, that's easy to fall back into? Where is, that, where is that spot in your life that he's warning you about? And he's saying, strip it off. Strip off the weight, but more importantly, especially the sin. And then that has me thinking, um okay, if God told me to strip off the weight and strip off the sin, then I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that sin because God told me not to. You know, that, that is a frame of mind that you could take. But that is not the frame of mind that Jesus wants you to have in this scenario. He doesn't want you to not sin because it's the wrong thing to do. When he is drawing you in and he's saying, come to me, love me. And when that part of that loving me includes not sinning. So in John 2, 1, it says that if you sin, there is an advocator that that pleads your case. And that if word in there is really big to me. It doesn't say when you sin. It says if you sin. So you're telling me that I can live consciously about what is sin and what is not sin. And... I don't, like, just like my wife, I don't, I don't, 
I don't cheat on, I don't not cheat on her because it's the wrong thing to do. I don't cheat on her because I love her. I don't, I don't look at other women because I love my wife. I don't look at other women because that's not how God sees them. You know, God says, I was in Florida and I was going to a school that I met these guys at and we were walking around in Florida and there's these, it's warmer weather there, obviously, and uh, people were wearing far less clothes than I found comfortable. Um, and I'm going to go to this ministry school and I'm gonna go out and evangelize to some people and I see these girls and they're, they're just dressed, in my opinion, un- un- inappropriately. Um, and I just started to get so angry. God, I'm trying not to sin. I don't want to look at that. I don't. Why would they dress that way? Why? And I asked God, and I got mad. You know, I don't want to look at that. I want to be with you. And he says, well, if you loved him, you wouldn't see him that way. He said, that's my daughter. He's like, I don't see the same things that you see when you look at her. Why do you see those things? If you loved me, you would see into her heart. And then I can effectively minister that way too. So it's the same thing with, you know, boys, girls, whatever. It's, you got to see them the way God sees them. And then through that, I'm not going to look at that girl because it's the wrong thing to do. No, I'm not going to look at that girl because I love Jesus. And I'm not going to go look at pornography because I love Jesus. I'm not going to sit around and slander and gossip because it's not the right thing to do. I'm just going to do it, not do it because I love him. So I think it's really important when he says, you know, I mean, people, and I just want to, I hope I'm, I know I'm really hammering this in, but don't not sin. What's the, what's the correct phrase for that? Don't go on, huh. is it don't not sin? I don't know, I just stopped myself. Okay, don't not sin because it's the wrong thing to do, but just don't sin because you love him. And that's just like a really great mind focus to have. And then it goes on to say, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. So this is just one verse, okay? And this is what goes on in my head when I read the Bible. And I think it's so much fun because I could sit here and read verse by verse and just tell you uh, what's going on in my head when I read it. And when it says, let us run this race with endurance, let's run with endurance the race God has set before us. So that got me to thinking, okay, I am running a race, and I'm supposed to do it with endurance. And here I thought all along, before I had Jesus, I was lost and depressed, an alcoholic, a drug dealer. And then when I finally found Jesus, after he's been searching me for so long, I thought that I had made it, you know? I thought that was the finish line. Oof, I made it. But really, it was the... It was the start of the race. It was the very beginning. When he became real to me, it was the very beginning of my race that I'm surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and I need to strip off sin and I need to run with endurance. Why would he tell me to run with endurance? Because this is going to be a long race, you know? A thousand years is one day to God, and one day is a thousand years. And what is the, like, if we could just know that our life here is fleeting, and it is so small, it is like a shadow passing, we would really get it that there's not that much time on this earth. I am 34 years old, and I feel like I've lived a very, very long time, and there's still more to live, but that time is still so short for eternity. We are all eternal beings, and we will live forever whether here or there. (laughs) It's just such an easy choice. And it it got me to thinking that if you, uh, me and Jacob were talking about this on Saturday. That's why when me and him meet, it's just like we are, by the end of our meetings, we are so excited about Jesus that like the last three times that we've been meeting, like we, at the very end of it, we can't do anything but just be like, ugh and just start laughing and just say the same words over and over. He's so good, isn't he? Isn't he so good? And I really employ you guys to grab somebody, go have, go have coffee, and talk about Jesus. You will not be disappointed. Meet there and say, hey, what is God doing in your life? If you don't have somebody like that in your life, find somebody like that in your life. 
it will go miles. But it got me to thinking, um, if you're ever, this is kind of a side thing, but if you're ever ministering to somebody and you're trying to tell them about Jesus, I love that, trying to tell them about Jesus. Do you have to try? Do you really? If you love them, you know them, you don't have to try. Just this Holy Spirit will tell you everything. But if you're telling them about Jesus and they say, man, you know what? I'm just on the fence. I just don't know. And I love it. If they, and this has been, and I, I think God just has like this, this in me that this gets brought up to me a lot. But, and they're just like, man, I'm just on the fence. I just don't know. And I said, wow, that reminds me of a story. There was a guy and he was walking along a fence. And on this side, there was God and God's people. And on this side, there was the devil and all the demons and the gnashing of teeth and the sulfur smell. God's side, there was beautiful colors. Some we don't even know heavenly voices, and then all of a sudden God's people go up, and the devil's people go down, and this guy is still just on the fence. And then the devil comes back up, and he says, hey, let's go. He goes, no, uh uh-uh. I was like, "I, I I didn't choose him, obviously, and I certainly didn't choose you. And the devil just laughs, and he goes, I own the fence, bud. Let's go. So people who are on the fence, let them know. Let them know. Please let them know. The devil owns the fence. It's time to hop off that fence when he says, come to me. Because that guy on that fence, the whole time Jesus is saying, please, please, come, come. Hey, is today the day? Come to me, 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 come to me. And then it comes to the end of his life. And then he finds out that sad truth that the devil owns the fence. So... If you ever hear somebody say they're on the fence, get really, really excited because you get to let them know who owns that fence. All right, so out of that first verse on 12.1, how do we do all that stuff? How do we, you know, I, I, was, I was kind of giving you a little bit of a cheat code there and got ahead of myself on how we do it. But if you're reading this Bible like I was, I said, okay, God, um, there's a cloud of witnesses, there's weight, there's sin, and there's a race. Please tell me how I can do these things. And God, being as super faithful as he is, he doesn't make you wait, he gives it to you in verse 2. He says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. (laughs) Praise God, that easy, (laughs) that easy. Here I am trying to work it up and think of how I'm going to do all these things, and he says, if you just look at me, all the rest will go. (sighs) When was the last time you looked at him? Like truly looked at him, face to face, nose to nose, eyes to eyes. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. So that right there, the wording on that, and I know there's uh, different versions of the Bible, but in the NLT, that's where I was reading and that's where it spoke to me. Um, They said, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. So I I did looked up a little bit of words. Um, Initiates means to cause a process or an action to begin. So Jesus has initiated that in you. He has said, I have taken the first step, and now all you need to do is what? Come to me. Thank you, Jesus, for taking that first step and initiating it. There is nothing more of love that he could have shown you than what he did by initiating that, by saying, I know you, and I love you, and I want you where I am. So if I must, and I do, I will give my life for you. Can't wait to watch the recording on that one. I'm going to write that down. That was good. So he initiates it. Not only does he initiate it, 
but he perfects it. And perfects means having all the required or desirable elements, qualities, or characteristics as good as it is possibly to be. So Jesus has initiated this in my life, and then once he initiates it, what do I do? You don't have to worry about that. Why? Because he says, I perfect it in your life. Because I can't perfect it in my life. I can sure try, and trying and struggling just really makes you tired until you let go and let God. And then there's that sanctification process that happens where you're stepping daily with him. And I remember when I was going through it with the Lord and I was like, once I get this out of the way, me and God are going to be sailing. And then once I got that out of the way, he was so kind to bring up something else in my life. (laughs) Once I get rid of this, we're going to be sailing together. And he goes, oh, okay, I love you. But there's this, this thing too. And he brings it up. And then you get a chance to work on it. Why? Because he's initiating it and he's perfecting it. Because we're a bride. And the bridegroom wants a spotless bride. What is it? A chaste virgin. One that's not been with anybody else. He wants one that has not been with the world. And if we're loving him and looking at him, then we'll lose our taste for the things of the world. We'll lose our taste for alcohol and drugs and gossip and slander and pornography. We'll lose our taste for those things because he's... And if you're not there right now, he's perfecting it. He's working on it. He's drawing you. He's wooing you. He's telling you. There's that conviction in you that's like, well, maybe this isn't okay. You're right. Listen to it. Lean into God and say, God, why? Is is this not right? Okay, why isn't it right? You know, talk with your elders, talk with your brothers, work through God together. That's why I'm so glad he gives us this cloud of witnesses and these people that we get to, to run and bounce things off of. Like in, in my job, we have a Monday meeting and we have a Friday meeting, and I am over the moon about these meetings. Thank you so much. <laughs> because when we get in these meetings, uh, I, Jason and Tiffany are um, the owners of the company, and I love the way they, they do this company, too, because um, we had brought a new guy onto the company, and it's sometimes kind of hard to get in with get in with us, and we have Austin, but um, he had made a comment that, you know, our morning meetings are, he doesn't really get too much out of them, um, but he just didn't understand. I mean, he wasn't living his life for the Lord or anything, but, like, when we get in our morning meetings, we mainly talk about... Uh, we start talking about work, and then we get off into Jesus. And then we try to wrangle it back into work, and then it automatically goes to, you know what, God spoke to me? Get some friends like that in your life. That even though we're running a company, Jesus comes up first. Like, we drop what we're doing to talk about him. We drop what we're doing to worship him. And it's like such a good role models I have, where it's, all that stuff's not important but he is. And then the best part, it says that he is a champion. A champion is a person who has defeated or surpassed all rivals in competition. Who, who are they talking about there? <laughs> who do they call the champion? Jesus. He has conquered every rival. There is not one that can stand up against him. Not one, and there's no one like him anywhere. He has went into hell and taken back the keys. He got what I deserved so that I could have what he deserves and that I could have it with him. So he's a champion, and it's like, Silence is not awkward. I keep telling myself that. Sorry, I keep sniffing into the microphone, too. So when I was... Let me, I don't think I finished the verse here. We do this keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. 
Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, the cross, disregarding the shame, and now he is seated in the place of honor beside God. So when I read this last part, um, I got uh, basically like sucked into a vision where it was, it was one of those visions where it was so real, it's like I'm looking at you guys now. My eyes were closed, and Jesus took me to this place. And if you want Jesus to take you to that place, just close your eyes when you're alone and ask him. He will. I mean, I'm, I'm not anybody more special than anybody else. But And this is like a vision that I haven't shared too often uh, because it was just so intimate and personal and real. And he showed me uh, the gospel. And I'll try, to, I'll try to work my way through it. Lord, give me what I need. Um, but as I was sitting there and I was worshiping, I was at a conference, and it was a ministry time, and just getting super duper wrecked, and I was just like, Lord, show me the gospel so that I can do work for you, that it becomes real to me. And uh, he showed me so well. So there's this vision of Jesus, and he, uh, he doesn't have a shirt on, and I can't see, like there's, he's sitting at a table, and <clears throat> you can tell that he's, he's got like a mallet, and he's working on something, and then he's got like a lathe, and he's doing this, and he's doing this, and, and I can't see what he's working on, because there's a bunch of sawdust everywhere, and he, he dips his hands into it, and he starts working and working, and all the while he's looking up at me. God, I just feel it now. Because when he looks up to you, when he looks up at you and he looks into you, that's just so real. But he looks up at me and he takes a step back and he takes a deep breath and he blows off all the sawdust. And he picks up what he was working on and it was a cross. And he was like, Jesse, before the foundations of this world were created, this was the first thing that I worked on. And on this cross, I will give my life for you, even though you don't deserve it. It just got me thinking, like, before he even made, he, he already had the sacrifice in mind, and what really blows my mind is that he made the very cross that he hung on. And I put him there. It's crazy. And then after that, it immediately shifted to a different vision. And I see like three Roman soldiers, and then their backs are to me. And I see my Jesus on his hands and knees. And then uh, the first Roman guard just, boom. Just kicks him full on in the ribs. And the second one, as Brittany was saying, spit on Jesus. And the last one said, you are nothing and you never will be. I don't even want to know you. And I'm thinking in my head, my Jesus, they did this to my Jesus. After he showed me the cross that he made to die on, I see these people just beating the crap out of Jesus and spitting on him and saying he's worthless. And next thing you know, one by one, they turned around and they all had my face. And it just really wrecked me because it just it gave me this sense of responsibility that I put Jesus on that cross, you know? And Jesus was just trying to show me that he gave his life for me as if I was that man who spit on him, who kicked him, who said he was worthless and said he was nothing. And when I didn't live my life for Jesus, I was that person. When I didn't choose to wake up and say, hello, Father, I get to meet with you again. And there's no place I'd rather be than in your arms. Love me, Jesus. Hold me. Talk to me. Just be with me. And it's just crazy to think that this man, 
You guys, you guys tracking with me here? It's just, it blows my mind. And then after, after I had that vision, um, I started to hear the word bride. Bride, 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 you're my bride, you're my bride. And I started seeing it in the scriptures too, that he was a bridegroom and that there's going to be a wedding and there's going to be a supper that we sit down at with Jesus. Please get in your Bible and find these parts because they are amazing. And it got me to thinking that, wait a minute, I'm a bride? I'm a man. I'm not a bride. I'm not wearing no dress. But it's really funny. I'm not really that manly of a man. I have all these girls, and you can, like, even in our work, like, I'm the, like, the least manly person there was is... Like when I came here, I got really excited because I drove Jason's truck to Menards, which was in Belton, and I was in Lee Summit, and he couldn't understand why I was excited, but that was like the, the, the manly skill I had, let alone pulling a trailer or driving a bobcat or, you know, whatever. Why'd you hire me? <laughs> I couldn't do any of those things. I know, he believed in me, and that was what Scott's word was, and I can't wait to share the testimony of how I how I've met these guys and where we've been and where I'm at now. It's just so much fun. But back to the bride, it got me thinking that I'm a bride and as a man, we gotta be okay with being a bride. And once you're okay with that, it really just opens up your life and it's a lot freeing um, because we get to love him and there's nothing better. I'm Jesse and I'm a lover of God. I'm Jesse the beloved. And if we're a bride, it reminds me of my bride. When I married Cindy, I said, and I'm the only one who cried, obviously. Did I share about my wedding last time I was up here? Does anybody remember? Yeah, it was a, a courthouse wedding. It was really funny. The lady was like, it's so funny. It's so nice to see people get emotional at a courthouse wedding. And I was, <laughs> I was like... Can we just call it our wedding? That would, be, that would be good. And my brother showed up in sweatpants and said, I didn't know this was a dress-up thing. So I had a little bit of a different wedding, but it was, it was really fun. I was so madly in love and still am with Cindy that I could not wait. Uh, we dated for a month and a half, and a month and a half later we got married. Thank you, Jesus, for my wife. But it got me to thinking, if I'm a bride and my covenant to my wife is... I love you today, I love you tomorrow, I love you now, I love you forever, I love you in sickness, I love you in health, I love you if we're rich or if I'm poor. I'm a bride. Who is my bridegroom? Anybody? Thank you. We are to be married to him. So what does your marriage covenant look like to Jesus? When you said yes to him, was it, I will love you, Jesus. You're so real. I will love you on Sunday from 10 to noon. And we'll have a great time. And then after that, I'm going to love football. And then Monday, I'm going to love my job. Tuesday, I'm going to love gossip. Wednesday, I'm going to love overeating. You guys get where I'm going here? What kind of marriage covenant is that with the Lord? So I, I really, really implore you guys to look at your life. And when I said yes to Jesus, how long ago? What does that look like now? What does that look like when I leave this building? What does that look like when I wake up Monday morning? And once I've found this out, my heart cry every morning is, Jesus, I need to know you. I don't need to know about you, but I need to know you. I need to know the one who I'm going to be with, the marriage supper that I get to feast with for eternity. And Jesus, I know that heaven can be now. And I ask you to just come and live inside me. And make me conscious of how you feel about me and how you feel when I talk to you. So it's like, I need, to, I need to know you more, God. I need to know you more than I knew you yesterday. 
I need to know you more than I knew you an hour ago. And that might seem a little radical, but when, when you know him, you don't want anything else but him because he just makes your tastes for everything stale. I used to like this, just like horror movies was a good example. I used to be the biggest zombie fan there ever was. I'm talking like black and white, George A. Romero, Tom Savini, like all over that kind of stuff. And you guys are like, what? But that's all I used to watch was just horror movies. And um, about three or four months ago, I, I don't remember what movie I was watching, but I kind of had a check in me where it's like, man, maybe, I don't know, I'm not really into this. It might be kind of scary. Ah, no, nah, it shouldn't be that bad. I used to watch this movie all the time. And then when I watched it, my heart started pumping, and it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun at all, because he gets my heart pumping like that, not fear. And I got to realize that I've lost my taste for that kind of stuff. That stuff does not entertain me anymore. Because God is not in that fear and that scary movie, and he doesn't want that in my life, because when I... And we, that's a whole different subject, but when you, when you choose to, to watch those things, you're inviting fear to live in your house. And I don't know about you, but I don't want my kids scared <laughs> because of something I've been doing. So I just uh, I choose not to do that. Not because it's not the right thing to do, but because I love them. See, because once, you know, once you know who you are and who he says you are, and to me, that only comes through spending time with him and having a relationship with him, you can, you can really start to see how the Lord wants to use you to impact your community and to impact your friends or to impact your workplace. Because there's, there's an altar and uh, God showed me an altar one time, and it was all these things that I that I do for Him, you know, pray for people. Used to give a lot of messages. Used to go out and worship all the places, and stand up on the airplane and preach the gospel. And then it all ties back into the come to me. Um, I was standing up and preaching the gospel. I was standing up and giving messages. I was worshiping on worship teams. Not because I love Jesus. Just because it was what I've been doing. And it's, it's what we do. You know, it's, I'm, I'm in this ministry, and this is what we do. But there's, there comes a point where you can be working for God and serving God and loving people that you just forget that you're doing it because of him and him alone, and then there becomes a lack of fire, and there becomes a lack of power. So I'm going to wrap it up with this. During this, um, this ministry time, during this song that's going to play, I really ask you guys, Just close your eyes. Close your eyes and let Jesus just speak to you. This is like one of my favorite songs that wrecks me every single time I listen to it because it's so good. So during this time, I just ask you guys to really, really look at where you're at with Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus and you want to know what I'm talking about, I'll pray with you. If you've never accepted Jesus before and you need this in your life, and I guarantee you do. And I was going to say there's some people that give an altar call and they put some pressure on it, but there, there's no pressure that needs to be put because he's already been putting that pressure on you for quite a while. So if you think today is the day and you want to give your life to him and you want to say yes, don't hesitate, because he owns, devil owns the fence. But during this time, just realize that you're a bride. 
and that there's times in your life where you can just spend and say, I love you, because he's already said it back. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. A thousand times again, I love you. And tomorrow I'm going to love you, and Jesus, help me love you. Jesus, we just worship you and we thank you. There's no one like you. There's nobody that even can be compared to you, Jesus. You're the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the lover of my soul. Jesus, we worship you. And we just magnify your name above everything we have going on in this week, God. We just declare right now that you're more important than all of it. God, and we give you the first. We give you the first of our time, the first of our love, the first of our thoughts, the first of everything. Lord, we just declare that it is yours and you can have it all. We just worship you, Jesus, and we love you.